welcome to the EMEA Recruitment Podcast, brought to you in partnership with our friends at Operation Smile. Operation Smile is an international medical charity providing life-changing surgery to children born with cleft lip and palate. You can find out more about their work on our website, emearecruitment.com forward slash operation dash smile. In this episode, we're joined by David van der Velden, Regional Talent Acquisition Lead at DSM in the Netherlands. He explains how a great recruitment process relies on the relationships between people. So hello, everybody. Welcome to the next episode of the EMEA Recruitment Podcast. As ever, we're doing this in partnership with our good friends over at Operation Smile. And as my colleague Rose has mentioned, we're delighted to welcome David onto the podcast today. So hopefully you can still hear me okay, David. Yeah, I awesome. hear you awesome. loud and clear. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So how, how's life treating you at the moment? Yeah, it's it's going well. Uh, I think uh, everybody in the recruitment knows that it's busy. It's uh, a, a busy time, uh, a lot of work for, for us, but uh, yeah. I need to be uh, need to be fair that it's uh, we're, it's busy, but it's also uh, fun and uh, and we're enjoying ourselves and uh, yeah, we're we're in a good place. Not only me, but also the team. That sounds that sounds great. And I know these are things we're also going to touch on a bit later in the conversation as well about generally recruitment and your experience that uh, spans back to 2006 when you started in in the discipline. So we'll get into that a little bit later on. But I thought as a way to kind of ease you into the discussion, if you like, uh, and uh, an interesting um, question to start off with. Um, I mean, as Rose mentions, we uh, partner with Operation Smile as a business and on this uh, podcast as well. So I thought I'd just ask you, given their um, charity name is Operation Smile. I, I just wondered what the last thing was that made you smile, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love that question. Um, I, well, I, first of all, I'm somebody who smiles constantly. Uh, it's some, but something I hear from a lot of my colleagues and uh, and people I talk to that um, that I always radiate a, a positive uh, positive uh, feelings and and a smile. So that's that's for <laughs> one. Um, but uh, yeah, it actually was really today, this morning, um, I, I'm in the office, uh, which is also uh, yeah, back at the office again uh, after a couple of uh, years and not, uh, trying to be here at least two days a week. And it's nice then to suddenly see people again. And uh, I met one of the hiring managers I've worked with in the previous time. And um, since I'm now uh, in the introduction, uh, it's already made it made clear that I'm the, the regional talent acquisition lead, but I'm doing that since Jan 1st. So uh, I was discussing with him that uh, they have two openings coming up and uh, we were discussing that. And I informed him that uh, that uh, because of my new role, um, yeah, I, I can help them to, to make sure that we know what's coming, uh, but uh, somebody else is going to pick this up, uh, another senior recruiter. And, uh, <laughs> and he came back to say, yeah, I told my boss and he was, he was, uh, he was asking, Oh, so we don't, we don't, we can't work with David anymore. Um, so <laughs> yeah, that's, that's always nice, right? If people love to work with you, um, that's always gives you a, a positive feeling, but it's also, yeah, I, I think it's also important to make, make them aware that my new role means that I'm, less involved with operational recruitment. I'm still involved with it, but not as much as in the past. So uh, yeah, it also means that other people need to to take care of it. And I'm confident that the, the people in my team, uh, that they can pick that up in a good way and I will support that. But it's, it's always nice if people uh, mm. give you a compliment like that, right? No, it's always, yeah, as you say, always good good to hear. It's, it's much better than the, the opposite. That is <laughs> so, yeah. for sure, for sure. Those are also there, but <laughs> so uh, no. <laughs> That's good. So I, I know within that, so you mentioned the word positive a couple of times, and you said at the start that you, you're known from your, your colleagues for being someone who, who's uh, smiling quite a lot, very positive approach. And, and I think... This is something that obviously when you are a positive person, it, it kind of comes naturally um, to you, I guess, And because there's plenty of people who see the glass half empty rather than see the glass uh, half half full. I mean, is it something that 
do you feel you've had to work on or is it just something naturally that you're a very positive person? No, I, I think it comes naturally. Uh, yeah, I'm somebody who really thinks uh, you need to enjoy every day. And uh, yeah, for sure. There's also bad days in my life. I think with everybody, there's sometimes a day where you think, well, uh, glad that this day is over. Uh, but I think from my side, I always think, but what can I get out of this uh uh, to take a positive approach and where can I improve? And it uh, doesn't mean that I'm not critical about things where we can do be things better, but I think you also constantly need to look at where are we, what are we doing well, uh, and also take that as a, as a positive uh, uh, point. And I think then it's easier to also look at, uh, okay, we're good at this and, uh, and we're doing a fine job, but where can we still improve and make things better? Um, and um, no, I, so I'm, I'm I'm positive, but I'm also not afraid to to voice my opinion and and have a drive to improve. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, that's interesting to, to hear. And I think uh, you mentioned there that you obviously enjoy uh, your job. You you clearly in, enjoy the discipline of re recruitment, given the the length of time you've been in in the discipline as well. And that that, that obviously has an impact on staying positive and then keeping you you smiling so i thought i'd just ask you how recruitment makes you you feel i mean it's quite an unusual question i guess but uh given <laughs> that you've, you've been in the field for for a good length of time you know I, it, I thought it'd be interesting just to ask you how actually the process of recruitment makes you feel yeah the thing was i think with a lot of at least if I talk to people in, in the field of recruitment, I think it's interesting to always see that a lot of people have just stepped into recruitment without being, you know, without having per se that idea in their head at, uh, for example, when they were at school or where they were at university, they just get into it. And it, I think it's similar with me when I, when I was needed to start my career, I, I, the one thing I thought was I want to do something where it involves people and where I can work with people um, because I'm, I'm somebody who loves to work together with people, but also wants to help other people to, 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 yeah, to, to change things in their life or to have an impact in that. So yeah, that is still how recruitment feels me. It gives me that feeling. Uh, it's, yeah, we as as recruiters, and it's sometimes strange because we do this on a day-to-day -day job. We are talking to thousands of people in a year and we hire, uh, uh, my team hires uh, probably thousand people for DSM. But for that person, it's a life-changing event. Uh, and I think there's enough research where it shows that a new job is literally very high in the, in the levels of having an impact uh, on people's lives uh, below a marriage and, and getting a, a child and, and buying a house. But it's in there in that top five. And that is something which I always keep in my, the back of my mind. I, I'm, I'm having a positive impact on, the, on people's lives uh, and giving them an opportunity to make a next step in their career. No, it's. I mean, I think it's, it's the right way to look at it. And exactly as you, you say there, I mean, it's... Uh, you know, because you're doing this as your 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 day job. You know, it's um, as you say, many people, you know, don't change jobs that that often, and and it, and it is a very big thing when you're you're changing jobs. You want to make the right choice, surround yourself with the right people when you're making these decisions, and uh, and you are helping people making life changing decisions from from that point of view. And uh, I mean, I think I remember when when I started out myself, one of my mentors said to me, uh, recruitment is a strange job, because it's the only job you, that, that's out there where the, the product you're working with that has an opinion of its own. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I guess uh, he was saying, well, that, that in that respect, it, it it's hard to keep smiling and be positive every day because uh, you never really know what's uh, what's around the the, the 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 corner you know so i suppose that's uh, yeah so it's even greater emphasis on the fact that you are very positive you enjoy the job and, and keep smiling that's uh, makes it even more more impressive huh? <laughs> I, I think no and i think that's precise what you're just describing these it, it's almost as if you were a part of conversations i had in the last couple of days with colleagues <laughs> because um yeah, this is precisely, this has been the discussion we've been having. You know, um, I've literally had a conversation with the sales director in DSM uh, a, a couple of months ago where I told him, you know, uh, he said, okay, but 
how does how does recruitment uh, relate to sales? I said, you know, we in in our role, you're also selling the the candidate, you're selling the company to the candidate. But the difficulty for us, and I and I I know for sure also uh, at your company, Paul, because you're in an agency and you're really trying to find the right position for your candidates in in different companies. It's selling uh, as a sales manager in DSM. It's you know you sell a product, uh, and that product has demand and and supply, and that's something you have to uh, uh, which you have to manage. But the product stays the same. The quality of the product stays the same. With us, precisely what you say, the product changes their opinion, uh, changes their view. Um, they can totally change uh, from day one to day uh, to the to the not, uh, to the the other day. So I think that is. I always I've been also at that side, and I always applaud uh, people, and still applaud people who deal with that because. Uh, yeah, indeed. I'm I'm positive, but uh, you know, I've also had enough cases where I really thought, "Oh my God, what has just happened?" And and how how has this happened suddenly in another way? And and but again, um, I think uh, uh, that also means that we we as recruiters tend to always celebrate when we get to hire uh, because we know how much work has gone into it and what has happened in between and what have, could have happened in between. Um, so yeah, I think that is always still a, a celebration uh, moment when it's when when you finalize a, a recruitment and, and close a position. Yeah, uh, and that is where you're still aiming for. So yes, it's good to reflect, but I always learned uh, take a cup, take a day to to reflect, but the next day just um, uh, take take it up again with a smile and think about other options. Uh, I think that is, and maybe we're already going into what makes a great recruiter. I think a great recruiter is somebody who also is able to adapt to those kind of things and come up with creative new ideas to get to new, uh, to new candidates or, or change things around with a candidate or a manager. Yeah. Yeah. And I think all of this being said, I mean, what, what do you think of the, the key steps in order to have an efficient and effective recruitment process, because uh, as you, you mentioned there, there's so many elements that, that change on a, on a day-to-day basis, but often if you have the key structure, structures in place, then you can kind of minimize the, these, these things from happening. So are there certain things you would advise the network to have in place in order to, to really work efficiently related to recruitment? Uh, I, I think what what I see is that the basis really starts with having a very good intake with your manager and really having a good conversation about what are they expecting, what are they looking for. Um, also, not be afraid to share your views and opinions um, because, yeah, sometimes we see. I think that is always the conversation I have with hiring managers where I say, you know, you you are the specialist in this specific field. You know what works in, for example, supply chain or finance or uh, production or manufacturing. But uh, I and my team are the specialists in recruitment. We can tell you if what you're looking for also works, how the market looks like. That is intel we need to bring. And together we need to shape, okay, what is then the process? And it's really important to set expectations right at the beginning. What are they expecting? What can we deliver? How are we going to keep each other updated? Because for me, recruitment there is really the team sport. You need to work together with a hiring manager. Um, They need to take their responsibilities where they are involved, and we need to take our responsibilities. And only if we keep challenging ourselves and being able to uh, provide uh, uh, constructive feedback uh, to make things better, then you get to great hires. At least in my experience, the moment that at the end of the process, a hiring manager comes back to me and said, hey, David, I'm really happy with the process. Most of that and with what the result we have, I most of the times immediately say, yeah, but it's not only me, it's also you. And the, mo- the hiring managers that understand that they also have that role, yeah, then it's, for me, the basics are there to, 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 to work. So if you don't have that relationship, um, that is something to really work for uh, because that will 
absolutely help you to uh, to get to the best results. And uh, like we discussed in the earlier question, deal with any bumps in the road in a good way. No, no, no. The, you, the things you're talking about here, having that that strong relationship internally and then externally with the people you're interviewing, but also you know, being able to challenge and influence people in the right way. Uh, I think this is one of the things that stopped a lot of companies hiring over over COVID. You know, there was a lot of companies who really held back on, on hiring people because they were concerned that that relationship was going to be harder to build um, on virtually than it was in person. But I know that DSM has really continued to push forward over the, the COVID period and, and, and hired a, a number of people you know so is there a way you kind of adapted your approach to do that virtually uh, any advice because uh, hopefully we don't go into, <laughs> co- into a COVID situation again but I, I think it's just interesting because I know there's a lot of companies now struggling a bit because they're trying now to suddenly you know bring people on board that they probably wanted to a few years ago and there's a lot of companies trying to do that and that's why you've suddenly now got a lot of positions on the market so I didn't know if there's anything you think DSM did that made them successful over that period of still bringing in great talent, but without necessarily being able to meet everybody? Yeah, I think it's it's uh, it's really about uh, having trust in one another. Um, for us, the advantage is that was, was that our team was already set up. So uh, I think for a lot of hiring managers, uh, the, the people they had to work with were not changing, had not changed. Um, so the, the recruiters were still there. Uh, we didn't have any changes in that period of time with the team. Um, so that was one. I think second is, is also the realization, okay, and, and there, uh, you know, we're in this together. Uh, we all are working from home. And leadership, I, th- I, I, I really need to say that our co-CEOs, our leadership has, has been from the very early moment in COVID been very clear on, you know, we're in this together. We were already at home, working from home in the Netherlands two weeks before the Netherlands, the Dutch government said we work from home. So we were already two weeks in advance. And I think that also shows that we were, you know, prepared in that way on, on this. Um, and yes, I think we also had discussions in the beginning about, okay, how we're going to hire, especially at the executive level. Um, but there, I have to be honest, I think there was not a lot of discussions we had to do. I think in, at a certain point in time, we just noticed that our business said, this is how we need to do it. People are working from home. All our team members are working from home. So then we also need to recruit f- virtually. And yeah, we've just done that and even like stated on executive level on really the highest levels uh we've been doing that uh and um and we're still doing that although we're back in a uh, in most countries we're back in an office we still see that we keep that virtual of digital uh, digital meetings uh we we also include again some face-to-face meetings because we also see that candidates value that especially if they're talking to their new manager, because that is, you know, you're going to work with that person. So we understand that people want to know who who they're going to work with and also see locations. But on the other hand, yeah, we work hybrid. We work in essence uh, 50-50, 50% from home, 50% from the office. And in a lot of cases, even in headquarter positions, it's even less than that. So, yeah, I think... If you're going to work virtual with people, then it's fine to also hire virtual. Hi, everybody. It's Paul Thomas here. I hope that you're well and you're enjoying the podcast so far. Thank you once again for your continued support listening to the podcast. I just wanted to break into the recording to talk to you about a really exciting partnership that EMEA Recruitment has along with Operation Smile. And as founder of EMEA Recruitment, it's an honor and a privilege to announce this partnership. Personally, I was born with a cleft lip and palate, so the mission of Operation Smile is something that I have a strong personal connection with. It's not an understatement to say that the dentists and surgeons that helped me were life changers. It's not only about the actual operations that take place, the support and care post and pre-operation are beyond value, and from personal experience I can only say that I'd not be the confident, happy person I am today without this support. 
I want to help children experience the support and care and skill that I experienced on my journey and hope that we can do this along with Operation Smile. Every three minutes a child is born with a cleft lip or cleft palate and the mission of Operation Smile is to provide help and support to these children through providing 6,000 medical volunteers across 80 countries who are dedicated to help these children with facial conditions most commonly cleft lip and cleft palate. More than 200,000 children are born with a cleft every year and they are often unable to speak, eat, socialise or even smile. However, it can take as little as 45 minutes and cost just 180 euro or 182 francs for Operation Smile to provide a child with life-changing surgery. Now in partnership with Operation Smile, EMEA Recruitment is raising valuable funds and aiming to create 100 new smiles to support the organisation to provide free surgeries for children and young adults all over the world. Please help us by donating through the link in the bio or get in touch to see how your company can help get involved too. For the moment, I'll leave you to carry on listening to the rest of the podcast, but if there's anything I can do in terms of answering any questions or finding out how you can help and support EMEA recruitments and Operation Smile, then please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you once again and enjoy the rest of the podcast. I think what you've said there, I mean, it's it's further evidence really about the the fantastic business that DSM is to, to work for. And I'm not just saying this because you're on the on the podcast. So I know this from people saying in, in my network, but also you look at the retention that, that DSM has, because I think that's the, the biggest um, element you can look at as to how strong the company is at hiring great people. It is one thing to hire people, but another thing to, to keep them in the business and forge careers for the long term, especially in this, this day and age um, where... There's more of a movement towards um, moving moving company to get progression rather than staying in one company. So, I mean, DSM has a fantastic record on on that side. But obviously, you know, whether it's DSM or any company, it doesn't always work out for, for some of the reasons we were talking about a bit earlier on with uh, you know, people having a, an opinion of their own and, and just for whatever reasons, sometimes it, it doesn't work. And and I know this is a tough question to ask. Uh, and the, the reason I ask it is because uh, because it is a tough question. It is what, what you feel is the true cost of the of the wrong hire. <laughs> and that's it, it's a really hard one. Uh, on the one hand, but I I always tell hiring managers that the true cost of the wrong hire are more than they would think. Uh, I think a lot of people just think it's the the costs of uh, the cost of the, the 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 salary I've paid for six months or um, uh, the uh, uh, the work uh, maybe potentially the work which is not being uh, performed. Um, but I also include, you know, it means that if somebody only joins, they have been trained by a team, uh, your team, that team has had to let go of other work, then suddenly st- somebody steps out and they need to take it over. Um, I think it depends a little bit where you're in the organization, but especially if you're in a business facing role, uh, customer facing role. Yeah, I think it you can, it can literally run up to millions because of the fact that you're you miss opportunities with customers, you you miss the engagement with customers. So that is also the reason why I would say, yeah, it's great to look at time to hire or time to fill a position, but in all fairness, uh, having a candidate joining one month later and it's being the right hire instead of the wrong hire. Yeah, I think there's a, a the, the costs of having it one month longer open are probably uh, way less than having the wrong hire. So with us, it's indeed quality over over uh, over speed. And yes, we we uh, we have speed. I think we are at. Uh, I, I've seen the recent numbers that we're currently still at uh, at, at sixty days time to fill. Uh, which in our business is uh, is quite good because we have a lot of niche roles. But uh, um, yeah, uh, we would like to reduce it, but not if we are going to uh, to miss uh, quality. I think that is the most important thing, and that's also what we see coming back from our hiring managers. We do uh, um, we 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 track our hiring manager satisfaction via surveys, and we we tend to see that. For them, uh, quality goes over the speed. Uh, we literally sometimes see that 
hiring managers who have had a great experience and found the right candidate and it's taken 100 days to find somebody, they typically are happier than a candidate hiring manager who has had a quick fix, but the, 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 the process was not good and the candidate in the end didn't work out. No, I mean, that's really, it was really interesting that you mentioned in, in that answer uh, some of the you know, tracking feedback, tracking happiness, let's say, uh, looking at your response times and, and time to fill roles and so on. So it's all really looking at the, the data and looking historically and how you can, can improve. And, and it leads me quite nicely on to the next question I had, because like it or not, the, the BI data, AI is going to play a, or is playing a big part in our lives now, but it's always going to play a bigger part in our lives at home and at work in, in the future. And uh, I wondered what you feel the impact of business intelligence and data intelligence is going to have on recruitment or the HR discipline in, in the future. <laughs> I think huge. Uh, um, I think we even, I would say in recruitment, but also in the whole P&O function, um, it ultimately need, we need it to become even better in our job. Um, and I do tell say this also because I don't believe that the job of a recruiter will disappear. No, but I think the, the data uh, and the business insights we get out of that can help us to be, become more efficient uh, to handle, I think, in the last years, and especially what you described, a lot of our colleagues have been over flooded with roles in the last couple of months. Yeah, I've also seen research where it clearly shows that uh, uh, recruiters are, I think, in the most highest demand there is. I think in the US, it's now the most sought position, uh, even higher than a software developer. Well, uh, other research also shows that 50% of our colleagues want to step out of recruitment because they're not happy in it, within it, because they feel that the workload is too high. And there, I think data and BI will not uh, be a threat to our jobs. No, they are there. They We need to get them on board in a more, I would say, in a more structured approach to help us to uh, be more efficient. And, and ultimately, it should help us to, like I said earlier, focus on the people. Uh, it allows us to focus on the candidates that matter and give them the time and uh, 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 and attention they deserve, uh, because that is, I think, the, the the biggest problem. I would see if we don't, uh, we we get uh, more roles, uh, uh, and that means that there's less time to give that attention to to people. And that is, in the end, where I think we can bring the value. It's about empathy. It's about uh, understanding uh, people, your hiring manager, but also candidates, and making that best connect. So, yeah, I, I truly believe that we need to, to get into that. I, in DSM, by the way, we are making strides in that direction. So from this year on, we, we have an internal uh, tool uh, uh, which helps us to really track data on all our people. Um, uh, so we literally see, okay, what is the, uh, the, uh, the attrition in, a, in a retention and attrition in certain sites? Um, and uh, what is the demographics? How do we see the buildup of our teams? Um, they're working on getting also our recruitment data in that same tool, now it, that it's separate, because then it allows us also to really get into the discussion with departments instead of, okay, you're hiring because somebody's left. No, let's look into the data. What is What do we see happening? Do we see indeed at a certain site uh, higher attrition? Okay. Should we then probably we should investigate what is the reason for that? Because yeah, you can backfill and 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 ask recruitment to constantly look for new candidates. But if we're not uh, solving the the problem, uh, which is the root cause, uh, then we're not solving anything. And that is really where we need to take steps. Uh, and uh, I think the where we want to go next, where where we're not yet, is also to get more with uh, more. Uh, yeah, working in recruitment more with artificial intelligence to identify candidates more based on their skills, on their personality, instead of on their experiences. Mm. Um, and I think that is for us the next step to uh, to also in our recruitment process bring that uh, into an uh, in, into a next phase 
uh, we are working with a tool uh, uh, from Eightfold, uh, which we are now uh, launching globally, which allows us as recruiters to look really uh, at skill sets of candidates. So that, that tool already works with an AI-based uh, uh, algorithm to look at, does this candidate match the profile? And it, and it allows us also, which I think is great uh, to see, okay, if we have a position open, uh, the, the system will look into the database of candidates we've had in the past if any of those candidates match, because that makes the life of a recruiter easier, because then if somebody matches, that candidate's already engaged with us. They are already interested in DSM, and we can come back to them and say, hey, we have a great job. That's also great for candidate experience. Um, but I think the next step is that system only looks at skills, and it looks at the skills on your resume. Uh, I think the next step is tools where uh, the system is not only looking at your skills on the resume, but also Via, for example, via assessment looks at what skills and personality traits do you bring? Does that match our company culture? And then we don't need you to have worked at company A, B, and C or studied uh, at uh, university uh, X, Y, Z. Then, yeah, you're taking that next step. We're not there yet, but that is something we're looking at. Yeah. Mm. No, it's really interesting. And I, I, I agree 100% with everything you, you said there. I mean, I think there is definite benefits to, to utilizing uh, the technology that is available now and that's coming around the, the corner. And uh, I think the, the the one thing that's certainly for the moment, at least, and you, you can't necessarily see in the short term, is that um, the technology is going to struggle to build relationships with, with people and get the, the cultural match and uh, you know, understand the, the ins and outs of uh, job seekers and clients actually as, as people and try and match those together and I think what from a, an external recruiter perspective I think that the what what BI and data is doing it's it's weeding out the um the lazy external recruiters you know I mean I think uh, you know because if you you can you know, there are some individuals who can do this job very by just doing the, the basics and, and asking basic questions and sending over basic uh, candidates over with 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 limited knowledge but actually what what I think this is forcing the the external recruiters and internal recruiters to do is to become to keep getting better at their jobs you know because otherwise that that part of their job will be replaced by bi and data the, the basics the screening questions and so on but it's actually getting to know the people better you know building relationships and uh, and having that you, you know having that positive attitude you know definitely definitely helps in this in this situation because people obviously gravitate more towards positive smiley people very often you know so that so that always helps yeah. in, the, in the job of recruitment i guess for you as well <laughs> <laughs> no for sure and and i i totally agree with you I, 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 like stated i don't think it will replace uh our 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 roles it will allow us to um to get i would say to get a little bit the gut feel out uh but you still need recruiters uh, still if you use those ai probably it's going to be accurate uh what i've understood from from data probably 50 to 60 percent accurate so it still needs a recruiter to precisely what you say do a very good screening to see okay, great that the system says this is a great candidate, but we still need to look into, does it indeed also fit the reality? Uh, and, and therefore, I think it needs to be the both uh, to, to get to the right result. I think only uh, the AI tool alone will not do it. But I also believe that like we've done in the past where only the interviews and the gut feel for, from people, managers and hiring managers and recruiters is the basis i think that's also something we we need to get away from yeah mm -hmm. no that's it's true and I, and I thought the question i asked really because we talked a bit about how you got into recruitment we talked a bit about the the challenges that that lie ahead but i thought i'd ask you a bit about your your current role i mean we've talked uh, slightly about dsm and and uh, who they are as, as a business but uh, i thought you know given that you're in this great role with them now i, I just wonder what it what it feels like to be in the the talent acquisition leads at the dsm at the current time i think it's um it's a it's a great honor to have the responsibility uh, i would say uh, to really be um, responsible for making sure that recruitment for DSM in the Netherlands is meeting what our business needs are, 
but also to look with a, a tactical and strategic mindset of how can we improve it and make it better uh, for the years to come. Um, and um, for me, like I said in the beginning, I, I, my previous experience was more in the operational recruitment. Um, last year, I was already uh, taking up some tasks as a lead uh, uh, besides my role as operational recruiter, uh, as a senior recruiter. And for me, the interesting part is now really to, I've always been interested while being in a, in a senior recruiter role to understand, okay, what were the dynamics? Uh, not just filling the role, but think, understanding, okay, what, what has happened before? And I think in this new role that allows me more to focus on that, to help my team uh, to prioritize, to help my team to, um, to find out where we can improve and uh, work with our business stakeholders to, to support them in the best way possible, to understand what are they looking for, but also challenge them to, to support them to find the best, uh, to best, to best support them in finding the right candidates and also evolve their business and their function. Because that is sometimes something I see is that um, if you've always hired in one way or you've always filled the position in this way, or somebody's leaving and that person has done the job in this way, that is a great opportunity to look at the position and think, does it still need to be in this? Do we still need to fill it in this way? Do the tasks and responsibilities still need to lie here? Or do we have an opportunity to look at evolving it and bring it to next level? And I think that is where I love this role to that I can involve, be involved more on that side to have those strategic discussions to look more beyond uh, the, the short term of filling a position, but really looking at, okay, what is happening? What do we see as uh, potential opportunities to improve? Uh, uh, how can we solve uh, the bigger issues? And then work to, towards a plan of, okay, how are we going to recruit? And um, so for me, that is, that is great. And I, and I love working with team members. Uh, I love to, uh, uh, to let go and let others do it uh, and help them evo uh, develop. Because that is what I've had in the past. I've had a leader who really gave me the opportunity to do things on my own, to, to do things uh, how I think they were best uh, and get to results and support me in developing. And that's also something I, I now want to do with my team, uh, to let them do it in their own way. Uh, within certain boundaries of how we see the process, but every person is different and reach results uh, can reach results in a different way, and and support them in developing and becoming better. I think that that is really what I what I love now in this new role. Um, is it? Am I still adapting since I've started Gen first? Yes, uh, for sure. I think. Uh, uh, if you've always been working as a recruiter and you've had 20 roles, uh, managing 20 requisitions, finding the right candidates, and now that's only uh, four to five and you're more focused on the strategic side, I, I sometimes miss that, um, that, 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 um, uh, that deadline uh, working, that pressure. Um, but yeah, it, what it, I get back from it is, is looking at how can I change things longer term? And if you come, if you reach that result, uh, it has a bigger impact than only filling that one role. Yeah. Mm. No, I mean, you mentioned there the importance for your learning and development for yourself, for the discipline and, and your enjoyment of helping others to, to learn and, and develop. And, and I thought a uh, good question to ask you might be if there was one thing that you'd, you'd wish you'd known at the beginning of your career that would have had a, a big impact on the future, you know, what, what, that, what that might be. Because I, I guess as you go through a career, you're always learning and <laughs> developing, but there's usually one or two things you think, Oh, if I'd have known this five years ago, ten years ago, uh, my life would have been a lot easier at that at that time. Is there anything that kind of jumps out to you at that stage? Yeah, I do. I think two things. One, um, I think that uh, what I would have wanted to know at the beginning is that uh, uh, that it's not harder if you're working with uh, more senior people or more senior uh, experienced people. Um, in essence, what I've learned in the recent years is that if you recruit on senior levels, the process is the same. Uh, the dynamics are the same. Uh, working with people is 
almost the same. Um, the only thing is that maybe the 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 uh, the um, yeah, the, the right or wrong hire has more impact in the company. But in the rest, it's pretty much the same. Uh, I think in the beginning of my career, I, I always thought, oh, uh, I, I looked up to people who were recruiting on higher levels and how do they do that? And in all fairness, it's n- it's not that different than uh, finding a operator, to be honest. Um, yes, there's different dynamics. They need to go through more interview processes. But it's it's still the people who have dreams for their career, who want to change things, who want to understand why this company is good for them and why they should join it. Um, yeah, there's maybe some more involvement and more effort into it. But if you really drill it down, it's not that different. So I would say to anyone who wants to uh, wants to make steps in in recruiting higher levels. Don't don't think that it's going to be that much different, and that it's going to that be that much more difficult. Be yourself. Be uh, do not be afraid to show what you know and what you bring to the table. Um, and secondary, uh, I but that's more personal. Uh, I think at the beginning of my career, I was not, uh, and it, it's it's related. I think. I was not that ambitious. Uh, I, I I thought I'm doing a job. I'm I'm loving my job, and uh, I'm I'm uh, I, I learn as I go. Um, what I've learned, especially in the time since I've joined DSM, um, is that you know if you want to if you want to do things and le- learn new things, just ask if you can be involved. Ask to 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 do things. Uh, ask if you can get. Uh, if you can recruit for a, a different role or a higher role. Um, and yeah, I think that has helped me, especially in the last years, to make huge strides to just, um, yeah, to just say, this is what I want to do. Uh, do you give me the opportunity to do it? And 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 if if you don't feel comfortable, what should I first do to get there? And um, yeah, that has helped me a lot. And what what's interesting in your answers to that question uh, is is aligned with the, the answer to a lot of other guests we've had on the podcast, regardless of their discipline and, and backgrounds, um, uh, around asking the question and just putting yourself forward for for things. Because the the reality is that the worst is going to happen is someone's going to say no, uh, which isn't the end of the isn't the end of the world. But if you don't ask the question, then you, you're never going to know whether the, the person's going to say yes. Or no, and having the kind of confidence really to put yourself forward for things which, which maybe are above your ability at that time. But the only way you're going to test yourself and learn and develop is by pushing yourself, going out of the comfort zone, and uh, and 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 you'll learn and develop as as a result. And I think uh, yeah, it's really really interesting uh, your answer on that because as I say, the other um, successful people we've had on, like yourself, you know that that's what they. They often mention it's just making it, trying to get to that mentality earlier on in the, in your career will will help a lot to push push things forward, um, which which is yeah interesting feedback and I know some of the network will take uh, take a lot from as well and uh, and I just I know we, we kind of we started the the podcast with a uh, a light hearted question and I thought I'd try and end the podcast with a, a similar <laughs> one really I mean you obviously through through the discussion you. You've hinted at things like focus and priority and having structure to things and in, in the in the day job. But obviously you tend to find that people who focus on these things in their job also try to do that in their home lives as well. And uh, and, and given you know you are a very uh, happy, smiley person, you're obviously you've got something uh, you've got you've got something going that, that's right at home and uh, and at work. So I just wondered, you know, are you very structured outside of the office as well? You know, do you have a, a uh, quite a, a strict um, uh, gym routine or things you like to do at the start of the end of the day that keeps you on track? <laughs> no, I can I, I honestly say no. Uh, I think <laughs> what I... No, I, I can honestly say that um, uh, um, being structured is something I had to to learn uh, uh, to become better in my job. And it's... Uh, I think it's absolutely not my strength. My strength is absolutely more in... Uh, result drivenness, uh, wanting to reach results, and and uh, being creative about how do we change things, and and um, and having different views and sharing those views. 
Uh, planning absolutely not my my strongest point. If I would, <laughs> I, I would say at the beginning of my career, I know that one colleague really helped me to to improve there, um, and I know she probably <laughs> found it very difficult to get me into that in into that shape. But I I really I really need still need to thank her for that because what it helped me is that it's not my like stated it's not my strength, and that's also where I believe in strengths and weaknesses. If you and maybe that's also still a good advice. Uh, I sometimes get these questions from candidates about of, about uh, things which they are not good at. I always tell you should only focus on what is really hindering you to to become better in your strengths. So make sure that your weaknesses are not going to block any of your strengths. So bring it up to a level where it's at par, where it helps you to to shine at your your strengths. Because making it really your strength is impossible because that's not who you are. Um, and that is what I've learned in the job. Uh, so, but I can tell you at home, that means that I'm <laughs> totally not structured <laughs> because uh, it's like stated, it's not my strength. I found I can be structured in some approaches. Uh, you know, if I, uh, uh, if I need to, uh, I'm the one who plans holidays, for example, in the family, I'm the one that they look at. To, to organize things and make a planning. Uh, but if you would ask me, I would rather go on holiday without planning anything. Uh, so, uh, but if it needs to happen, I will step up to do it. And uh, from a, on a personal note, I love cooking and cooking is preparation. So, uh, uh, so there I've at least learned to do it. But I can tell you, my wife always, always complains after I'm done with cooking that the kitchen is a mess. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I love the planning up front. But uh, uh, my wife always says, uh, you know, cooking also means that at the end, the kitchen needs to be clean. And that's <laughs> something you miss. So, no. <laughs> So I've got I've got to ask uh, David what what's your uh, kind of go to dish when you're cooking then have you got like a, a speciality one that, that you tend to, to roll out um, no I'm pretty diverse so uh, I, I love I've started more into the Italian kitchen uh, uh, cuisine uh, and uh, so I love making a risotto but the, the problem is is that my my two daughters are not risotto fans so I only make <laughs> it when my wife and I are alone uh, because we love it. Um, no, but I've I, in the in the COVID I've also moved to uh, Asia uh, Asian cuisine, so can make my own dumplings, uh, um, make my own uh, uh, bapaus, but also barbecuing. So I'm a big fan nowadays of low low and slow cooking. So uh, I can make a decent pulled pork uh, from the barbecue, which has been there for eight hours. So uh, yeah, that's uh-huh. something I I really love doing. So I'm I'm in that sense diverse. I love in finding out new dishes and and also not afraid to experiment with uh, new dishes which i never made i like to take a risk in that sense <laughs> tells you also a little bit about my life of my work life that i like indeed new things um so uh, but no so it, it's a multiple multiple things but i yeah i i really uh if you're in the netherlands you should and you're here <laughs> you should come by <laughs> this is it so i'm uh, i'll order a risotto in advance and uh yeah, yeah, <laughs> no up, so yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, that's good so uh no i mean a huge thanks to, for, for being on the podcast today david i've really um appreciated your time i know i've taken a lot from this myself but i know the network will also take a lot from the conversation we've had and, and one of the things that really stands out which i always love when we have guests on the podcast like yourself is that there, there's clearly a a passion a driver for the job that you're that you're doing you know i mean i think that that is clear it comes through in the way you present the 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 tone that you talk about so the your your job and, and your life generally and i think it's it's always it's always nice to hear and nice to see and i think that uh yeah any other people looking to get into the the job of, of recruitment so uh, you know, you're a good example of actually what you can gain from that and the and, and everything that's all the benefits from it as well so a huge thanks for uh, being on the podcast today and i was going to say obviously if any of the the network want to reach out what's the best way they can do that uh, I think uh, the, the easiest is always LinkedIn. So uh, you can absolutely reach out via LinkedIn and uh, and send me a message. Happy to connect. Um, uh, you can also find my uh, personal uh, mail address and 
uh, on, on my LinkedIn uh, info. So uh, if, you, uh, if you connect and want to send an email, that's also fine. Perfect. So ho- hopefully you don't just get now loads of risotto orders. Huh? That's uh, but, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. I could keep you busy. Ah, that's, a, that's uh, yeah, also good. In the kitchen in the mess, huh? <laughs> that's also good. No, so <laughs> I, I thank you very much, uh, Paul, as well for uh, uh, organizing for uh, the questions. Uh, really enjoyed it. Thanks. Uh, that's great. I uh, really, really enjoyed it. Thanks, David. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day, and uh, yeah, huge, huge thanks again. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. If you'd like to reach out to Paul or myself, please feel free to send a connection through on LinkedIn. And if you'd like to listen to previous episodes of the podcast, you can find them all at our website, www.emearecruitment.eu.